The Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation, preparing society and meeting the needs of an aging population. And now, here are your hosts. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith in um, home quarantine. Well, I'm not actually in yeah. home quarantine. I guess I'm in... Uh, you are in, social uh, distancing yourself. I'm social me. distancing. I'm... Um, what do we call it? Uh, it's not lockdown. Shelter in place. Yeah, I'm in shelter in place. That's what I am. And for because this is going to come out a little while from our recording. This is March 18th. We are still kind of in the middle of the pandemic. Um, hopefully going to prevent the surge. We'll see what happens when we actually get this published out. But we have a special guest with us today. So we have Laura Petrillo, who's a palliative medicine investigator at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston and Harvard Medical School. And Laura's been on our podcast previously when she was at UCSF as a palliative care fellow and then as a research fellow. Welcome back. Thanks so much for having me, guys. It's great to be here. So we're going to be talking about a really important topic in both palliative care and in geriatrics. It's immune checkpoint inhibitors. We're going to learn a little bit about them, but importantly, we're also going to talk about some of the outcomes that Laura has done some great research on with an article that was recently published um, in Cancer titled Performance Status in End-of-Life Care Amongst Adults with Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer Receiving These Immune Checkpoint Inhibitors. Um, We'll have a link to the article on our show notes, but before we dive in the article, we always ask for a song request. You got a song request for Alex? Yeah, actually, um, I was thinking about Radiohead, no surprises. Okay, and this has got like the most depressing lyrics I have ever sung on the <laughs> Jerry Bell podcast. Can you share with us why you chose this song? Uh, I mean, I think part of uh, what we'll talk about eventually is just that um, it's helpful to know what's what's coming with any therapy uh, that you embark on. Um, and so one thing that I think uh, hopefully, um, this paper and other kind of real world evidence, um, will start to show is that there are, uh, some unanticipated, um, kind of risks or burdens to treatment. And so in any good kind of informed consent risks, benefits conversation, there shouldn't be any surprises. So, uh, that uh was no surprises. No okay. surprises. Yeah. But it was uh, not quite as dark as the lyrics would sort of, <laughs> <laughs> Great, here we go. You look so tired, unhappy. Bring down the government. They don't, they don't speak for us. Quiet life, a handshake of carbon monoxide. I miss you in my office, Alex. I, I can't control your mix here. Yeah, I promise I won't actually insert the real Radiohead uh, version. Uh, so, Laura, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Like, how on earth did you get interested in this subject? So, uh Immunotherapy, which is just kind of the whole class of medications that use the immune system to fight cancer, um, is a kind of new paradigm of cancer treatment, incredibly important, transforming the landscape for so many different types of cancer. And so just as a palliative care clinician, uh, currently I mostly care for people who have cancer um, and just seeing people live longer, have really different outcomes um, with uh, immunotherapy and then with uh, traditional chemotherapy. And yet 
sort of, I also noticed uh, that there were differences in some kind of end of life experiences that people were having and wanted to just see what we could see in the data and um, explore a little bit about what is happening for people who are not typically represented in clinical trials. And can I ask you, when you embarked on this, kind of what what were you seeing kind of boots on the ground as far as any concerns or differences? Yeah, so um, people who um, may be familiar with immune checkpoint inhibitors and immunotherapy um, from seeing it in the news, Jimmy Carter uh, getting immunotherapy uh, for his cancer um, and having a wonderful response and others and a lot of uh, things in the, in the media just of these incredible stories of um, people having good responses to immunotherapy. Um, but one of the phrases that was sort of bouncing around clinically was, no one dies without immunotherapy. And that was because, mm. you know, as a, in contrast to chemotherapy, which, you know, cytotoxic chemotherapy, which can be so toxic with so many side effects at the end of life, you know, when you're thinking about risk and benefits and kind of framing those conversations, there are these really clear trade-offs between feeling worse with the hope of gaining some more time um, versus focusing on quality of life. And I think that when these agents sort of first started to come out with, you know, some incredibly hopeful uh, outcomes for a subset of patients and in certain types of cancers, there was the feeling that, oh, they're better tolerated. You know, they have a whole range of banana side effects, which we can talk about separately. But at the, at the outset, they seem like they're better tolerated in general. And so the feeling is kind of why not? If someone is otherwise you know, either not in shape to receive chemotherapy, they've already received chemotherapy, to hear something that is kind of better tolerated, what is the harm in trying one of these you know, potentially a miracle agents um, for someone who would otherwise be transitioning to hospice? And so immune checkpoint inhibitors are in sort of, there are different indications across different cancer types. Um, they're most widely used in uh, melanoma, lung cancer, uh, head and neck, renal cell cancer. There are a lot of, um, there are a handful of cancers, but they're varying in terms of how successful they are. They're very successful in, in melanoma and lung cancer. They've been helpful and widely used. So when they were first approved for lung cancer, though, they were approved in that second line setting, so previously treated patients. And I think that that affected that attitude about trying them prior to making a transition to comfort focused care. Mm -hmm. Can we, taking a step back, um, can you describe for our audience who, some of whom may have heard of immune checkpoint inhibitors or immunotherapy, yeah. some of whom may not, um, what is an immune checkpoint inhibitor in sort of really lay terms? Sure. And what, what are some examples of drug names they might be familiar with? Absolutely. So in general terms, um, the way that immunotherapy works is trying to get the immune system to be activated to fight cancer. And so in general, you know, when the immune system sees any type of invader, like a bacteria or a virus, um, it's activated to recognize not self. But cancer cells typically sort of shut that off the same way that our own self cells shut that response off. And so immune checkpoint inhibitors inhibit that inhibition of the immune system. So they say, immune system, come on over, attack the cancer cell, um, because that kind of little shield is no longer up to protect the cancer cells. They inhibit the pathway that is inhibiting the immune response. And so that is partly why we get those really crazy immune-related adverse events, the kind of side effects of checkpoint inhibitors, uh, because the immune system is activated and then can uh, attack other tissues in the body. Can you tell us some of the common side effects that we should kind of know about in both geriatrics and palliative care? Yeah, absolutely. So interestingly, the most common side effects are very nonspecific. So they're like fatigue, nausea, but then there are very important side effects like uh, pneumonitis, uh, which is inflammation in the lungs, obviously, and um, can cause a uh, uh, serious respiratory problems, colitis, and um, so attacking the gut cells um, and causing uh, bloody diarrhea. Um, and uh, rash is common. Um, but then there are these uh, even uh, more kind of toxic side effects like uh, myocarditis, um, which can have a high fatality rate. So most of the fatalities from immune checkpoint inhibitors are from uh, kind of some of the more severe uh, immune-related adverse uh, events like uh, myocarditis and pneumonitis. There are some other wild ones like 
uh, neuro side effects um, that can attack the neuromuscular uh, system and so um, can cause side effects that can be paralyzing. Um, mm. And so there's, and transverse myelitis, I've seen a lot of kind of crazy things. So it, any, basically any system in the body can be attacked um, and cause uh, side effects that sometimes will mimic known autoimmune diseases. Um but sometimes are entirely new phenomena and we're, we're actively learning about them now, mm. you know, kind of in real time with patients. There are mm-hmm. some that were observed in um, clinical trials, but there are certainly more that are becoming mm-hmm. more clear um, as they move into pr- prime time. And what are some of the common medications or drugs, names of these immune checkpoint inhibitors that our audience might be familiar with? Yeah, absolutely. So pembrolizumab um, is one that's used commonly in lung cancer that we will talk about, often used in combination with a platinum doublet chemotherapy. Um, and then the nivolumab um, is another one, ipilimumab. Um, so you might hear Ipi and Nevo. They have these like cute little short names, mm-hmm. Ipi, Nevo, Pembro. That, that's um, great because I never know how to actually pronounce these. They're... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It ends in MAB. That's the key. It does, but that's not a, that that's a, not specific. There are right. others. So there are other drugs that end in MAB that are not immune checkpoint. Yeah. Inhibitors. Yeah. But the ones you'll see the most often are nivolumab, uh, pembrolizumab, ipilimumab, atezolizumab. Um, yeah. Those are some and of them. But they're still more. Yeah. Those are the generic names. Yeah. Um, what are the, you know, the brand names for these, just in case yeah. our audience have heard of some of those. Yeah. Uruvoy, Optivo, and Keytruda. Keytruda. Yeah. Keytruda. Yeah. The commercials <laughs> for Keytruda. Yeah, exactly. I think all the MABs are monoclonal antibodies. And then, um, that is true. And, yeah. And then yep. you kind that of is. go from there. Yes. But not, uh, I guess not all MABs are checkpoint inhibitors. Yeah. So the checkpoint inhibitors mm-hmm. are either the, PD-1 inhibitors are CTLA-4, and so they're both working on that pathway that is helping the cancer hide from the immune system or stopping the cancer from hiding from the immune system. That's great. Um, Anything else by way of background that we, we should know about immune checkpoint inhibitors? Yeah, I mean, I think that the main thing to know is just that uh, in settings like melanoma, for example, they are just having such a drastic effect on survival. So metastatic melanoma survival after a diagnosis would be kind of less than a year uh, previously when we were sort of in the in the pre-immunotherapy uh, era. Now, there, there had been IL-2, which actually also worked by affecting the immune system, but it was not very well tolerated, so it wasn't used a lot. Um, but when immune checkpoint inhibitors came along, we now have patients living years. And for some mm. oncologists, we'll even use the word cure for people with metastatic melanoma. So it is wow. a huge difference. And it doesn't, you know, those kind of results don't happen for every patient who receives these drugs. Um, but the hope of that kind of long-term, I use the word kind of durable durable response um, as opposed to cure because I think that, that we're still sort of learning. But uh, there's just that hope that, you know, that will be the miracle drug. And, you know, I kind of, um, I'm on some Facebook groups of patients talking about these drugs and they're so... Mm-hmm excited and so thrilled with the kind of long-term response they've had. And and I've had plenty of patients too, who just are living, you know, they didn't expect to live to their daughter's high school graduation and they're living to college graduation. And it's just, they don't even know, it's just so incredible. So there's a huge amount of optimism. And I think that it is very much warranted. And these are really exciting drugs that are transforming the landscape and, you know, combinations are coming out and ways to make uh, them even more effective um, and mm-hmm. other ways to use the immune system uh, to fight cancer um, that are, are different kinds of immunotherapy that are, it, the hype and enthusiasm I think is is really, um, is warranted. I'm a believer, but I think that just from the supportive care point of view, there isn't a lot to understand. Um, and there's also a lot to understand for kind of all adults, not just the ones that are in clinical trials. So that's why we set out to do this study. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a good segue to, we're, we're seeing a lot of people get this, even people with exceptionally poor performance status. And how do they actually respond to these um, uh, new treatments? Do you want to tell us a little bit about kind of what you did in this study, kind of sum it up as far as who was included and kind of the the methods of it? 
Sure, absolutely. So in clinical trials, um, as you know, um, they'll usually limit people, uh, limit participants to people who have, who don't have a lot of comorbidities and who have good performance status, which is, you know, the oncology lingo for functional status, um, who just are not limited in their uh, activities of daily living or in their amount of activity um, in any way. And so uh, it's not an entirely representative population, particularly of previously treated patients with cancer. And so in, the, in our study, we did what kind of a real world study um, and included all people who had received uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors over a period of time, um, over about two years, um, and just looked at their survival outcomes of so the length of time from the time that they received the checkpoint inhibitor. Um, and then we also looked at some other kind of end of life healthcare utilization outcomes. Um, we included people who had, you know, every performance status level, um, as opposed to the clinical trials, which are limited to performance status zero or one. Uh, performance mm. status for living people goes all the way up to four. Um, and so usually um, people with uh, worse performance status, performance status two, three, four, certainly four, but two, three even, are limited in receiving chemotherapy. Can you and remind then, us what performance status of two or three or four would look like? Yeah, absolutely. So um, performance status two is uh, no longer working up and about uh, greater than 50% of the day. I mean, these are kind of mm -hmm. how these things are graded. And they're clinically... Mm -hmm. Um, determined by the treating clinician. There's huge kind of variability person to person and um, and between patients and clinicians and how they uh, gauge performance status. And I would say in general, clinicians probably round down a bit with the uh, performance status levels to justify treating patients. But, so round down um, meaning like closer to zero Giving people uh, the benefit the of the doubt, you know, mm -hmm. and I and I, I think it's I don't think I'm, I definitely assign no ill will to that. It's it's mm -hmm. kind of giving people the chance to get treatment. Um, but but I, performance status of two, you're saying, would not be eligible for a clinical trial. And you just described that as somebody who's uh, if they're if they are working, um, if they're working age, if they're they, they might not be working anymore they, they uh, due to working. their illness. And they might still be getting up and about and taking care of themselves, doing their activities of daily living. The light work was one. Um, and then two is self-care, but no work activities. And for those who want to look at the ECOG, we'll, we'll put up a ECOG up on our website too. So you can see the difference between one through four. Five is yeah. the simplest one, which is dead. Um, uh, I've, I've never actually seen somebody code as five, but um, I guess people do. Yeah, it's not usually at the top of your mind when that's the one yeah. that's the setting you're in. But. And, and you looked at the difference between performance status on the ECOG of 0, 1 versus greater than 2. Is that right? Yeah, and we did sub-analyses of uh, ECOG 2 only because um, there's a lot of interest in that particular group. I think that people feel... Uh, less strongly about three or four treating um, them. I think you can make a stronger case for kind of comfort focus measures uh, in general, but PS2 in a, in a place where you might be worried about giving chemo, but um, thinking about another drug that could be better tolerated, that's sort of, you really want to think about risks and benefits carefully and, and of course, preferences. Two doesn't sound, I mean, I'm just trying to convert these into, you know, patients I've seen or, you know, disability scales I'm more familiar with from the sort of geriatric side of things or a palliative performance scale. Two doesn't actually sound all that disabled, quite frankly. Right. And I think that, um, you know, working is a hard um, thing to use. There's plenty of reasons not to be working. Um, but this is, you know, assuming that that uh, activity limitation is due to cancer and cancer uh, side, uh, cancer symptoms. But it is. It's the main thing that we, you know, that oncologists use and that is used in these clinical trials. So that's why we, that was what we included. And we wanted to include this group that is, that comprises a large proportion of people who are, who have metastatic cancer um, mm -hmm. and who are being excluded and who are receiving these drugs and kind of receiving counseling from um, their oncology team potentially uh, about what their survival might be like. Um, but that is um, kind of gleaned from a different group. Mm -hmm. All right, and it I... looks like in your study, you had 35% of patients who had a performance status of two or greater who would not have been enrolled in a clinical trial. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And about 5% with an ECOG of three. And these, these people can 
are capable of limited self-care, but mainly can find a better chair for more than 50% of the day. So about like, one in 20 are receiving this in your sample. So again, 5%. I think there is some survival bias present here because you can think that people who kind of got through their first round of chemotherapy or first line or two of therapy and who haven't uh, made an option to kind of transition to comfort focus care, there are certain people who would kind of make that transition prior to thinking about another line. Um, so that is a consideration that there's a, a bit of survival bias in the previously treated group. Well, what did you find? So uh, when we looked at survival um, according to performance status, um, one thing, just one more kind of side note before we go there is just that it can be hard to tell the difference between kind of the prognostic and predictive significance of uh, performance status or functional status generally. Because if you think you take all comers who have these different levels of performance status and you follow their survival afterwards, um, it's like, you know, similar similar thing happens with age. People are just going to live less long. I mean, these are predictive of, these are independently predictive of survival, right? Mm -hmm. So um, doing that on its own, just saying that the survival, what, what we found ultimately was that they lived less long, like punchline, they, they lived less long. And I can give you the numbers in a second, but what we were unable to do, which would have been great to do, but it, we were unable to do because of the, the way that, um, you know, this is a retrospective cohort study is be able to say, among people who had an ECOG, an, an ECOG performance status of two, if they had a checkpoint inhibitor versus didn't have a checkpoint inhibitor, how long would they live? And that would um, give us um, some insight into the predictive value of the performance status in this uh, outcome. But we we don't have that ability. We didn't do a randomized trial. We did a retrospective study. So um, we know that it has prognostic significance to have a worse performance status. Um, and so what we found was that among um, people with a uh, performance status of zero or one, um, the median overall survival, so um, you know, the, if you took the, the curve of patients, the middle of that curve was 14.3 uh, months um, in the, the performance status zero or one group. Um, and in the performance status two or greater group, it was four and a half months. So really different. Um, if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves, um, it just is a really different shape, drops off a a lot more steeply for um, the PS uh, two or greater group. Mm -hmm. So I guess the, the 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 point here is that um, checkpoint inhibitors are not some miracle drug for patients who are have some degree of disability and uh, non small cell lung cancer. So I think that one thing to just keep in mind is we don't know, you know, what would have happened. We don't have the counterfactual of what would have happened with these patients if they hadn't received it. And we also, you know, the the median overall survival is the median. And so there are going to there are some patients who lived a while. Um, and I think that one thing um, that is um, another thing that's important to note, there's so many kind of caveats and backgrounds to give here, but for all checkpoint inhibitors, whether or not uh, checkpoint inhibitors will be successful, um, at least in lung cancer, can be um, predicted somewhat by the presence of the receptor. So PDL1, um, the, the receptor for these uh, that indicates that the tumor might be sensitive. And so um, that predated, or, or this study kind of predated the widespread use of um, the PDL1 test. So um, it may be that there's a subgroup that does well here um, that might be indicated by uh, having uh, the presence of PDL1. Um, and it may be that, you know, without these, people did worse. So what we can say clearly right. is that people with uh, worse performance status don't exactly do as well as the people with performance at a zero or one. So you can't just extrapolate those clinical trial results when you're having a conversation with an adult with functional impairment. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to push you out, Laura. Uh, it, it, having done this study and getting the results that you have, like, does it inform what we should do maybe differently in either geriatrics or palliative care when we're caring for individuals who maybe thinking about starting these medications um, or are on them? So I think we need to move to the second part of the findings because I think that that mm -hmm. is a, an important piece to inform that conversation. So 
part of what I was curious about from my clinical experience was, you know, if proceeding with this idea of no one dies without a checkpoint inhibitor, does that, is there an opportunity cost in terms of the conversations that people are having about end of life, their preparation for end of life, how they're kind of receiving their care um, and whether they've made, you know, transitions and how that care is being delivered. Um, And so we looked um, at the we first looked at kind of the proportion of patients who were receiving checkpoint inhibitors very close to the end of life because just with the precedent of kind of chemotherapy in the last two weeks of life and in the last month of life being a real indicator um, of kind of high utilization of healthcare at the end of life, we know that that correlates with um, you know increased death in the ho- death in the hospital, increased hospitalization, decreased kind of hospice and comfort focused care. So we looked to see if the same was true here if people who got checkpoint inhibitors close to the end of life also had differences in the end of life care that they received. Um, If this sort of Hail Mary approach uh, to kind of end of life treatment forestalled any of that um, type of care that we, you know, that we, not every person believes that that's the optimal type of care, but if if it did in general uh, delay uh, that type of end of care. And we did, we found that uh, patients were kind of less likely to receive hospice care, um, that they were more likely to die in the hospital, um, and uh, they were more likely to have been hospitalized in the last uh, month of life uh, than people who had who didn't receive checkpoint inhibitors in the last month of life. So it was um, similar to chemotherapy, um, something that affected um, the end of life uh, outcome. And I mean, I think that you can. It makes sense. It's logical. Um, people are receiving checkpoint inhibitors, they may have one of these crazy side effects or you may have heightened suspicion for one of those side effects. And so, you know, something that might be a symptom of uh, cancer progressing or just a cancer-related symptom might, um, in, in, in a time when we're trying to understand and learn more about these um these immune-related adverse events might prompt admission um, to a greater degree, so people were, were hospitalized more often. They, in fact, did experience these uh, side effects, and I think that that was a reason for some of these hospitalizations. Um, and just the other thing to know is that it takes a little while to have a response. Um, you have to kind of get the immune system going. And for people whose cancer was on a timeline to be close to the end of life, and you don't necessarily have that time for the for the effect to, to work. So you never really know um, when you see a patient in front of you how long they have, but functional status is one of our best clues, right? So you think we've got mm-hmm. these, um, patients who have um, kind of worse than functional status and um, they may be close to the end of life and, and it's not totally benign necessarily to give them a checkpoint inhibitor only in the sense that it, um, it might delay some of the kind of transitions in care that would help people to avoid burdensome uh, end-of-life interventions and have care that's more focused on uh, quality of life at the end of life. Mm -hmm. How expensive are these? Expensive. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking tens tens of thousands. thousands Yeah. 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 And and typically given as an infusion once uh, once every every, two to three weeks. Yeah. Two to three weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So incredibly expensive medications. It'd be hard for a hospice to justify right. um, paying for one of these medications right. um, because it would cost them so much money. It would mean they had to make trade-offs in terms of other services that they could provide for patients. Yeah, and I think um, there are other settings where um, you know more, some not like my my general interest is kind of novel cancer therapies and kind of supportive care and palliative care um, for them and particularly helping people sort of understand the the risks and benefits and and understand their prognosis in the setting of these. So I think a lot about targeted therapies as well um, in people who have cancer that's kind of like addicted to an oncogene. And in those settings, actually, uh, some of the oral targeted therapies can be actually really palliating um, and kind of the idea of continuing them into hospice makes so much sense. Um, and those here, are like pennies like morphine. Those are really yeah, they're pennies. They're, they're they're not pennies <laughs> at all. Um, no, they're expensive too. But I I actually um, see a different case for those um, because actually continuing them even beyond progression can be palliating and can alleviate Wait. symptoms. Whereas here you're kind of going for this. It's it's like a gamble. There's not a guarantee that you're going to have a response. You have like maybe 
I don't know, a 20 or 40% chance of having a response at all. And then if you do, it's, it's hope for this kind of long-term response. And so the thought had been, give it a shot, see if it works. I mean, there are, there are very incredible stories of people coming into the hospital. I, one of our oncologists has this story about a person coming in with kind of metastatic melanoma with leptomeningeal disease and getting, you know, a dose or two of checkpoint inhibitors and like walking out. I mean, there's just really wow. incredible yeah. kind of rising from the dead sort of stories about these drugs. And I think that if, you know, particularly if clinicians have seen them, they're really hesitant to withhold anything like that. Patients have heard about it in the news and they're interested in it as mm. well. So, I mean, I think that I, I totally understand where the interest come from, comes from, but I think that what is important is to have full knowledge of these potential um, kind of trade-offs between uh, mm. the potential benefit, give, giving mm. that roll the dice to see if you have that effect versus kind of what other things could be moving towards um, preparing for end of life. Mm -hmm. I I have two more questions. The first is uh, you mentioned targeted therapies and distinguish them from immunotherapy, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Mm -hmm. Could you just give us sort of a lay understanding of what targeted therapies are and how that's different from immunotherapy? Yeah. Sometimes, and just as a caveat, because there's so much um, lingo, sometimes people will say that um, immunotherapy and immune checkpoint inhibitors are targeted, which is very confusing um, because they are targeting the, you know, PD-1 pathway um, and the kind of immune, uh, that um, immune response. But in general, um, targeted therapy seems to be used more for uh, drugs that uh, specifically target um, overexpressed oncogenes or um, oncogenes that are driving uh, cancer growth. So examples would be kind of BRAF in melanoma um, or EGFR, ALK and ROS1 and other um, uh, oncogenes in lung cancer. Um, so this is where there's just a clear um, gene that is that has been mutated or copy number kind of increased so that they are or rearranged so that they are um, that uh, gene is really driving the tumor growth. And then the um, the drugs that target that just shut it down. Um, so they work in a different way. They're really specific, and that's why they're called targeted. They're really mm-hmm. specific um, for their target. Um, and ha- they do have side effects, although kind of some, particularly lung cancer is what I'm most familiar with. Some of the newer generation are better tolerated. Um, but they're just, they're oral drugs. they um still expensive, um, still fancy, but... Um, it's just it's different. Um, immunotherapy, uh, most when I the, the class of immunotherapy includes immune checkpoint inhibitors, um, uh, but also includes things like CAR T therapy um, and t- mm. and TILs like tumor infiltrating uh, lymphocytes. So there's just uh, a different different class of cancer treatment. Laura, can I ask you one one last question from my end? I think Alex said he had one more question. Um, now you you did this in an academic medical center. Um, I can only <laughs> guess which one, um, which probably also <laughs> had a lot of access to palliative care for these folks. Yes. Do you suspect that maybe if you went into other, again, it's so hard because it's a very specific type of academic medical center where a lot of right. people go to from other places. Do you suspect right. if you looked elsewhere, you'd either see worse numbers as far as hospice use and those types of things or better numbers? Like how, how should we think about generalizability of your findings that you saw here? It's a great question. So one thing that I sort of tips off what our um, end of life uh, experience is like here is just the hospice rate. I mean, there was just compared to the national average rate, a really high rate of just hospice referral in general I here. Shocked. Um, really high. Really high, really, really high. Um, we do have a lot of palliative care here um, and a lot of uh, outpatient palliative care integrated. 70, er, early integrated. 71% of the, integrated. Yeah. I see Jennifer Temmel is on the paper. 71% of all of the patients received hospice services. Um, 68 for those with performance status between zero and one and like 55 mm-hmm. for greater than two. So, or 75% for greater than two. So, yeah. And yet we saw differences. I mean, I think that there, and, and, and there wasn't really differences in, um, I couldn't look at palliative care, receipt of palliative care actually, because we have so many palliative care studies here that, uh, people were getting palliative care through other studies. So it wasn't necessarily that they were referred by their clinicians independently. 
So I couldn't look at that as a factor in some of these end of life um, outcomes uh, necessarily. I did look at clinician behavior because there that is one of the hugely um, impactful things for a hospice referral. But no, I mean I think that um, certainly the uh, performance status findings I think are relevant. Um, in different places, just thinking about, just have pause, you know, when you're thinking about counseling a patient who has a functional status limitation um, in, in uh, recommending or at least um, feeling like there's limited harm because they're better tolerated, just thinking about the range of potential drawbacks, um, I think would be important. Um, and then in terms of the end of life outcomes, I, um, I think that there, there are is likely um, to be similar patterns of of high higher utilization given the kind of side effects the um, the uh, just difference in overall mode of care the insurance issue I think the insurance thing is kind of one of the clearest things that probably drove this kind of needing to continue with uh, kind of uh, your our standard gear of uh, medical care uh, when somebody is not on hospice, if you're receiving these type of uh, drugs, which would land someone in the hospital with uh, any type of uh, change in their um, symptoms. So I think that all of those things are likely happening elsewhere. And I'll just say to, you know, we presented this work at the um, ASCO supportive care uh, symposium last year. And so many people came up and were kind of taking pictures and sending it to their colleagues being like, oh yeah, I've seen yeah. this. I've been worried about this. I've been thinking about, you know, I, I want to be able to talk with people. I know that it's different. Like they've seen that, you know, their um, patients are not necessarily mimicking the clinical trials and that there may mm-hmm. be differences in the kind of end of life care they're, they're receiving. So that was pretty validating um, yeah. to feel that at least in Anecdotally, people felt like they had a shared experience. Alex, did you have a last question, or uh, that was my last question about okay. the, uh, the the implications for clinical discussions? That's great. Yeah. Well, Laura, I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, I really so appreciate it. Um, again, given everything that's going on here, um, how about we yeah. end with a little bit more of that depressing song, Alex? <laughs> <laughs> The depressing song gives it away, right? We've been able to talk about a non-COVID uh, topic for this amount of time, but you know, <laughs> in my head, true that at least at this time, the majority of patients we're taking care of, uh, in fact, all of the patients on our palliative care service, not, uh, do not have COVID. Um, that may change over time, and may have changed by the time this podcast comes out. But we'll go back to this song that has the. The lyric, I'll take a quiet life, a handshake of carbon monoxide. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so think of just how grim that lyric is. <laughs> okay. A heart that's full up like a landfill, a job that slowly kills. That won't heal. You look so tired, unhappy. Bring down the government. They don't, they don't speak for us. I'll take a quiet. A handshake of carbon monoxide, no alarms and no surprises, no alarms and no surprises. Laura, a very big thank you for joining us today. It's always great to see your face and hear you. Um, Alex, it's good to see you greater than six feet away. And to all of our <laughs> listeners, thank you for joining us today. Um, and a big thank you to Archstone Foundation. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, guys. Great Bye, to see everybody. you. Bye. Take care.